so much. Well, Aaron, I'm Scott, by the way. Aaron, hi, Aaron. I'm Scott. Oh my hi. gosh, have you guys nice not met? You. No, that is nice. I'm so sorry, Scott Johnson, uh, Aaron Carson. I almost just said Aaron Johnson. It was so close. Uh, and uh, Aaron works at Tech Republic with Jason Heiner, and she's super smart on VR. And Scott runs a podcasting network and is an illustrator and is super awesome. And you guys like a lot of the same things. There you Sweet. go. Yeah, no, uh, Scott, oh, no, wait. I've seen you on the show before. So. You didn't meet oh, yeah. Darren either. Darren Kitchen. Hi. Hi, Darren. That's person. Aaron Carson. How are you? Same applies, except yeah. insert hack five. <laughs> and subtract illustrator. Uh, my illustrations aren't as good. <laughs> but he is a subject of many of them. Yeah. Good That's deal. only because I lucked out getting Friday. Yep. These are right, good illustrations you know this things. past week, I have to say. Oh, yeah, that's true. It's on my desk still. I, I did the stick figure. Oh, that is good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're ready. Um, any last questions, concerns, needs to run to the bathroom? Last questions. Mm. Can I see the that? wine list? <laughs> <laughs> Would you like the sommelier to bring it out? <laughs> All right. Well, let's get what this would you pair with this podcast? I, you know, I would probably pair a Shiraz for this one. Uh, a because liver and a sweet, a nice Chianti. We're going to have notes of encryption, and uh, but also virtual reality. So you need to have a bold red. I feel. Mm -hmm. right. It's a very geeky podcast. Yeah. <laughs> All right, have a good show, everybody. All right, here we go. Daily Tech News Show is brought to you by me. You're welcome. But it's also brought to you by over 4,000 other people who also find some value in it every day. If you listen for the next 30 minutes and get even a little bit of value out of it yourself, consider going to Patreon.com and searching for Daily Tech News Show and giving some value back. Now roll that beautiful theme music. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, February 17th, 2016. I'm Tom Merritt. Got a packed show today. Scott Johnson joining us as he does most Wednesdays, founder of the Frog Pants Network. How you doing, Scott? I'm good. I'm just glad to be here on a show where Wednesday actually has some breaking crazy news, and it's super uh, awesome to be a part of it. So thanks for having me on. Later in the show, we're going to be talking about virtual reality and joining us to chat about that as well as the headlines. Aaron Carson, multimedia editor for Tech Republic. How you doing, Aaron? Good to have you back. I'm great. Thanks so much for having me back. And of course, the breaking news yesterday about Apple uh, and its fight against putting any kind of access into its encryption uh, got us to talk Darren Kitchen into coming in on, on Not Friday. Uh, so just at the top of the show, Darren's going to join us uh, and, and discuss a little bit about the technical aspect of that story. Thanks for joining us, Darren. Yeah, woohoo! Hack the planet, encrypt all the things, they're trashing our rights! I'm excited, let's do this. <laughs> all right, let's start off with the headlines. Last night, Magistrate Sherry Pym of the U.S. District Court of Central California ordered Apple to assist the United States Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, in breaking the password of an iPhone 5C used by one of the San Bernardino attackers. Now, the FBI wants Apple to provide a signed image file that could be loaded using the device firmware upgrade mode to allow electronic entry of multiple passwords without the delays, if they can management, manage it, that are built in uh, to slow people down from entering software, uh, but also, more importantly, to get rid of the feature that could delete data after 10 failed attempts. In other words, they want to brute force the password on this phone. Now, the key is getting Apple to provide that signed software so that the phone in question trusts the firmware upgrade. Apple is rejecting the request based on the precedent involved. In an open letter to customers, CEO Tim Cook wrote, once created, the technique could be used over and over again on any number of devices. Electronic Frontier Foundation is supporting Apple's appeal of the order. Now, there's a lot of debate about what Apple could do here. It's a 5C. If it wasn't an iPhone 5C, it would have the secure enclave that is associated with Touch ID, which Dan Guido has said would be difficult to modify. However, former Apple embedded security engineer John Kelly, who's now at Square, has said on Twitter that if Apple could be forced to modify iOS, they could be forced to modify the SEP firmware as well. So he believes it's a moot point. So really, 
what Apple is fighting here is on principle. In fact, Bruce Schneier says they might have even helped the FBI write this request to make it clear that this is technically possible, but Apple doesn't think they should do it anyway. Uh, the court is using the All Writs Act of 1789 as the basis of the request. And it would seem that Apple would need to convince on appeal that the request is burdensome. Uh, so we can, we, we've had lots of discussions about whether backdoors should be allowed. Uh, and Apple is taking a very strong stance here saying this is a tantamount to a backdoor. And so we don't think it should be legal. We think Congress should weigh in on this, not a court. But let's talk real quickly about the updatability of the secure enclave. Darren, does Apple have to write the security software in a way that would allow it to change it if it had to? Well, if Apple doesn't want to undermine its security and, of course, its brand reputation and customer confidence, then, yeah, it needs to. It needs to, you know, write it in such a way that this doesn't become an issue for them going forward. If you, like, take a step back and forget the atrocity, whatever that was, I, haven't, I don't pay attention to bad things, and you stop looking at the law as, like, this law thing and more of like a set of rules, kind of like software is written, then this court order can be seen as a vulnerability against a would-be secure system. So if Apple wanted to remove the All Rights Act as an attack vector, then it would need to rewrite iOS in such a way that the encryption partition is tamper-proof. And it is possible to design a system in such a way that altering the security functions of the operating system would thus render the data useless. As it stands right now, uh, Apple could give, you know, push a version of iOS with their signed code to this device that would allow the FBI to do a brute force attack on the device. Uh, the decryption on the device does require going through their AES function, which from what I understand of the technical aspects does take 80 milliseconds. Uh, typically, what you would want to do as an attacker is extract this information from the device and put it on a more powerful device, typically a, a very beefy FPGA-based cracking system specially designed to brute force passwords. But as Apple's system with the secure enclave and such are designed, uh, it, uh, the attack would have to take place on the device. Uh, so brute forcing this, uh, if, if you throw out the whole 10 tries and then wipe the system feature, uh, would take anywhere between 30 minutes if it was a simple four-digit pin code to about five and a half years if you've got a six-character alphanumeric, and it gets exponentially harder after that as you start adding more and more characters. So, and that brings up another point, is the FBI must be fairly confident that they think this is a four-digit passcode uh, or, or it would be useless. If they knew it was a longer password and they knew it was going to take years to crack it, they wouldn't bother. I don't think there's a way for them to know, but I believe they're just, they're, you know, doing the due diligence and trying, or at yeah, least in this right. case, you know, trying to get the court order to get Apple to provide a version of the operating system without this 10 try and wipe feature. And if possible at the same time, get the, you know, uh, the decryption algorithm sped up a little so it's not 80 milliseconds per attempt. This is a very narrow request. Uh, it is the kind of request that usually people say is, is the way you should make a request. I need only access to this data on this phone, uh, and I have a court order. Uh, so it is significant that Apple is blocking it because they say, we think that this is burdensome. We think that this will be a bad precedent and that it would be used uh, to allow essentially the legal equivalent of a backdoor. And we don't want to be in the business of creating software, which is what they're being asked to do here, creating software that undermines our own security. Right. I guess it comes down to the interpretation of what's considered reasonable. If this were such that Apple just had to go to the back room and grab the right key, then one could you know, say that it's a reasonable request for the law to say, hey, Apple, give us that key in the back room. Considering the fact that Apple actually needs to write very specific software signed with their keys to be uh, loaded onto this using the, the DFU, it's a bootloader, right? There's ways to secure those bootloaders, but it, it isn't in this case. Um, and one could, you know, argue that that's not reasonable. And it, so it is technically possible for them to comply with this. They are fighting this on principle. However, it's for a reason because this undermines the entire security suite for all users. Uh, see, if Apple does comply with this, then the entire encryption suite is rendered moot as then any court could then take the same process to get at the data. So if Apple does want to make a secure version of iOS that is immune to this, I call it a court order vulnerability, mm -hmm. then the next version of the iPhone would have to, you know, use 
a method where the user data is either tamper-proof or they could even lock down the bootloader completely so that uh, it's, it's encrypted with the key that the user sets up uh, at the time of setup. The problem with that is that it makes it a lot more difficult for them to refurbish phones when you take it back to the Apple Store and for them to be able to load code onto there. So maybe a little notice where the user accepts the fact that if they want to enable that function, that once it's a brick, it's a brick for good. Uh, but ultimately, what's at stake here is Apple's brand credibility and the reputation. All right. Well, Darren, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to explain that to us. Any, any more questions for Darren before we let him go? I just wondered if you think this goes, um, if, let's say that this court order uh, is pressure, you know, there's a lot of pressure to make it happen and Apple doesn't want to do it. They're, they're standing on their principles to, to not do it. The EFF is behind it. Does this go all the way to the Supreme Court? I guess I'm asking for a weird prediction that's out in the, in the ether, but I'm very curious about how far this goes because it does seem very plain and simple. Either get us in or keep appealing until you get to, you know, the men in the black robes. So what do yeah. you think? This is really scary because unlike your, uh, your other alternatives to cracking encryption, which is the, uh, the $5 wrench approach or the rubber hose approach to breaking uh, encryption, from what I understand, the person that owns the encryption keys to this device is no longer alive. So that's not a, uh, so, so that makes this a lot more sticky. And actually, this is a ridiculous, slippery slope because if this sets a precedent, then the same could apply to Microsoft operating systems, Google operating systems, open source operating systems, and where does it end? So I really hope that this does go, uh, you know, does go further enough to set a precedent in the opposite way and say, no, you know, if you, go through the effort of securing your device in a manner where it can't be unlocked, then, then that's the case and no, you know, like, it, there's two ways to go about it. You can fix it with the law or you can fix it with technology. Uh, I'm okay with either approach. I kind of prefer the technology one because, again, the, the rubber hose thing. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see how it shakes out. But, you know, I'm rooting for personal privacy in this regard. All right, folks, if you want more of Darren's uh, analysis, more news, more hackery, check out hak5.org. Uh, we're going to let you go shoot some yeah. stuff with drones now. All right. Thanks, Tom. It's been great being on. I, I got to get to something now. All right. Thanks a lot. We appreciate it. Yeah, uh, Darren will be back on Friday, but let's continue with the headlines. Twitter announced it is turning on a GIF button for all users over the coming weeks. Seems to pale in comparison in importance to the previous story, I know. But you haven't seen what people can do with GIFs yet when they're allowed to just have easy access to them, unless you've been in Slack. Uh, it calls the button GIF Search. The search is powered by Giphy and Riffsy. You can choose from pre-selected categories or by searching for specific words. Aaron, excited about more GIFs and GIFs in your Twitter? Um, yeah, I mean... I was thinking this must be the first feature in a while that Twitter is introducing that people are actually excited about. So good for them. <laughs> but um, yeah, but it's almost kind of hard to believe they, they haven't had that already if you just kind of look at the proliferation of GIFs in um, popular culture and in messaging apps and, and whatnot. So you just kind of figure, I guess it's about time. <laughs> I, my, my wife converses with a colleague of hers almost entirely in GIFs. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that with like Bitmoji. Yeah. That's kind of my... I wish I could go back to 1994 or so and tell myself what gifts were going to do one day, and I would not believe myself when I told them. Facebook announced that any publisher can start using its Instant Articles platform. Remember this? This is something they started with select publishers a while back. This starts on April 12th. Facebook launched the service with partners back in uh, last May of 2015. It serves up articles within Facebook's faster uh, than if they were served by an external site. So sounds like we are out of quote-unquote beta stage and on to the next stage. It's got that 15% rule where you can only have 15% of the content be ads, and some publishers don't like that. They don't think that's enough ads. Uh, I, I can't tell if this means Facebook thinks it's successful enough to open it up or if Facebook needs way more people to try it, uh, but I guess we'll find out after April 12th that a bunch of people start using this. Google introduced a feature called Gmailify to its Android app. Uh, it checks email from other services like Yahoo, Hotmail, and Outlook. At least those are the three to start with. But manages the accounts as if they were hosted on Gmail's server. So if you're using the Gmail app 
on Android to manage your mail, it will now manage your Yahoo or your Microsoft mail exactly the way it manages Gmail. This will apply Gmail's spam filters, organize emails by type, apply the advanced search operators, add things like travel and hotel reservations to Google Now, all that stuff. Yahoo has a similar feature that they want you to use. And of course, Outlook has an import tool to get you to come over to Outlook. And uh, coincidentally, Outlook.com came out of preview today. So it let the, uh, let the web-based email wars begin. In. Yeah. Also, uh, it'd be nice to see if they go multi-platform with this as well, and you know, offer it to maybe even inbox users and and give some of that robustness to the back end to other accounts. I think that'd be great. Leap Motion announced a new project called Orion that integrates its motion tracking uh, directly into virtual reality systems. It's a very interesting uh, inception of sorts. Leap Motion expects several VR companies to release headsets that incorporate the Orion sensor. Uh, no word on, I don't know that we'll have any word that the big players, uh, it's primarily, you know, people at Oculus and, and uh, the uh, Vive are going to do this, but very interesting uh, thing from Leap Motion, I think. And it's, it's Leap Motion, not Magic Leap. I think that confuses some people. Magic Leap, the AR company that we're waiting to actually get a real product from. Leap Motion has a real product that you can plug into your desktop and you can control your desktop with motion detection. Uh, it is, I have one, it's okay. Uh, but people are saying that I've tested this, uh, that this, this version works even better and it would be a killer app if it were a sensor included with say a phone, a smartphone that could be used in something like Google Cardboard. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about VR in a little bit, Aaron, but what do you make of this news that Leap says, hey, we're gonna have some deals, maybe not with the big guys, but maybe with a lot of third party or smaller VR makers? Yeah, I mean, for me, I feel like I've, I've kind of been waiting to hear something like this. I mean, it's, it's funny, obviously, they were around before this whole big wave of VR. Um, so yeah, it makes sense for them to <laughs> kind of get a little bit more specific. Um, you know, but something that I've been hearing a little bit is, you know, people wondering about um, kind of, you know, with all the integration with, you know, gesture control and, and, and whatnot, having hands in VR, um, haptics are super important. And for some folks, it doesn't quite cut it to only be able to take like visual cues that you're interacting with something versus, you know, feeling vibrations or whatnot. But um, yeah, I mean, we don't have the kind of the full slate of details. So I guess yeah, you never know. Yeah, yeah and that Leap doesn't have, you know, if, if you don't know how Leap works, folks, Leap, Leap is just motion detection. So that haptic feedback is would have to be an accessory, which would kind of almost defeat the purpose. Yeah, it's a bit like a, it's a bit like Connect in that sense. It's yeah. it's um, sort of yeah. seeing what you're doing by moving, and there's no other resistance or anything. So yeah, they've been, there's a challenge with that, I believe. Alphabet, which if you recall is the name for the company that owns Google now, uh, has renamed Google Ideas, which is its think tank, to Jigsaw. Uh, Google Ideas head Jared Cohen will serve as president of Jigsaw. If you're not uh, familiar with Google Ideas, it's the unit charged with solving things like privacy, security, terrorism, human trafficking uh, by influencing public policy. This is, this is Eric Schmidt's pet project. Mm. And nothing to do with the uh, evil uh, protagonist in the Saw films. Let's just make that clear. Mm, I hadn't that. put that together yet, or well, does it? Next time you go to the campus, if they put you in a room with a lot of saw blades... Let me know how it goes. Uh, Instagram has uh, confirmed to Engadget that it has begun slowly, in their words, rolling out two-factor authentication. The system sends an authentication code as a text message. I have yet to do any of this or see it, so I don't think it's rolled out to me yet, but I think that's always good when a service supports two-factor. Uh, two yeah, and also it's a good week for Instagram when we had the addition of multiple account management and now two-factor authentication, which if you're going to have multiple accounts in one uh, single failure point, it's probably good to have two-factor authentication. Tying it to the phone probably is okay in Instagram's case because they're a mobile app and you're pretty much not going to be using it without a phone. Uh, it would be nice to have some kind of authenticator system uh, other than the phone. Just, you know, there are people that use iPod touches and stuff like that. Somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Apple told the Economic Times that it will open a new development office in Hyderabad, India, with more than 150 people supporting maps development. The Economic Times has other sources, though, that tell it the center could employ as many as 4,500 people eventually. Uh, and it does look like Apple is trying to lease a 250,000 square feet center in Tishman Spire's Wave Rock facility. I, I imagine you don't need 250,000 square feet if you're only planning on hiring 150 people. Or just working on maps. Like, there's more that going on there, I would bet, 
and um, I'm sure we'll find out soon enough. Indian mobile phone maker Ringing Bells, love their name, has released an Android phone called the Freedom 251 or 251 rupees, uh, excuse me, for 251 rupees for about, that's U.S. dollars, four bucks. That's super, super cheap. The 3G 4-inch smartphone runs Android 5.1 on a 1.3 gigahertz quad-core processor with a 960 by 540 display. The next web notes that the phone shown in the newspaper ad does not match the one on the website, which can be a problem. Uh, Ringing Bells told NDTV's uh, Gadgets 360 the device was made possible with, quote, immense support from the government. The uh, company will accept pre-ordering starting on February 18th. That would be tomorrow. And shipment of the end, uh, by the end of June, thanks to Tech Engineer for posting this on the subreddit. That's pretty crazy, though, that price uh, for any device, small or big or slow or not. That's, you know, four bucks. I think we can do it. Do you believe it? No. I, the fact that they've got, I mean, they could have the wrong picture in the paper for all kinds of reasons. Somebody just did the paste up art wrong or had a temporary image in there and then forgot to swap it out for the real picture. Uh, but $4, I mean, these parts cost more than $4. Yeah, I don't, I don't, if, if they would have done the, if the photo thing hadn't happened, I would have been skeptical. The photo thing makes me really worry. Having, having dealt directly with some sort of, uh, I don't know what to call them, but some experiences I have when we were doing a lot of buying and selling for a company I worked for with China, we would occasionally run into something like this, where what we were being sent was not what was being shown to us. And whenever that happens, I get skittish. So I'm not saying that's absolutely a sign that they haven't figured out a way to make a sub $4 device. Uh, but it does seem a little fishy. So proof in the pudding. Let's see some phones in people's hands. Let's see them ringing and working. You buy it, Aaron? I, my initial reaction, uh, sort of similarly after the disparity between the two pictures, is like, well, if it sounds too good to be true, <laughs> you never know. But yeah, and I think that I had read that the more attractive of the phones and the pictures was actually like um, a $45 model or something like that. Yeah. So... <laughs> yeah, which I mean, it's still a great price, but yeah. you know, if you're touting four bucks, two hundred fifty-one rupees, geez, that's that's ridiculous. All right. Well, thanks to everybody who submits stories at our subreddit. Uh, lots of you. I mean, there was no doubt you were interested in the Apple encryption story today. Uh, and thanks for all the submissions. DailyTechNewsShow.reddit.com. Uh, you guys are the best when you get in there and vote. Let us know what stories you want us to hear. And that is a look at the headlines. All right, uh, so Aaron has been working on a story over at Tech Republic that's out, uh, looking over Google Cardboard. Goldman Sachs predicts VR will be more popular than TV by 2025, uh, you wrote. Uh, and then Google has been throwing resources into VR. There's rumors that we're going to get uh, a standalone VR product, uh, possibly, definitely some kind of new VR product from Google uh, over the next year. Tell us, Aaron, a little bit about you know, what, what you found and what you're feeling about Google's cardboard VR at this point. Yeah, so I think that Google Cardboard has been absolutely fascinating to kind of watch evolve. When they first announced it at, or handed it out at I.O. in 2014, you know, the general reaction was like, what, what is this, you know? And, um, and, and from those in the VR community who have a little bit more of a past and have a little bit more of a say, like frame of reference, there was a lot of skepticism that this was a terrible way to introduce people to VR because it's not really VR, it's 360 video, you know. And so, but the funny thing that has happened in the past two years is you've just kind of seen it um, work its way into, you know, product demos and, and sales and marketing and all these in journalism, all of these kinds of little, you know, areas. Um, and so for them, it all looks very positive. And so not long ago, uh, Clay Baver, who's sort of, you know, in charge of all this, um, you know, had a post that had all these really great numbers about cardboard, you know, that there are five million units out in the wild and there have been 25 million, you know, downloads of cardboard and all this kind of thing. And so whenever I see a pile of numbers, I just like to dig into it. Um, so, so, you know, uh, I think the thing to remember is that these are really early days. Like this is going very well, but you also have to remember, for example, you know, a little bit more than a million of those units that are supposedly out there in the wild came from the New York Times in November when they put out, you know, their, um, their app and mailed out units to subscribers. You've got, you know, 75,000 from Outside Magazine. You've got, you know, um, 
you know, companies will order in bulk and have units that are, you know, sort of printed up with their logos and hand them out, you know. So a lot uh, of these probably end up in trash cans, sadly. Yeah, see, that's the thing is there's not a really good way to, to figure out, well, like, how many of these are actively used. Um, I have two sitting on my coffee table at home that I, I just, like, have not used, but they hand them out like candy. So, <laughs> you know, that factors in. Um, but it's been interesting because I kind of started working on this just shortly before the Financial Times had reported that, you know, possibly the next version that we're going to see is not going to be cardboard but plastic and have better lenses and, you know, potentially some sensors um, to kind of go with it. And so you have you have all these little signals, it's kind of hush-hush, oh, they're, they're moving, you know, a set of ten people over to kind of a dedicated design team and this is happening and that's happening and and before you know it you realize well Google's really getting serious about this so do you do you think that their their seriousness only extends so far as um, the Google Cardboard initiative in that this is uh, uh, meant for devices like mobile devices this isn't a uh, oculus type effort where we're plugging lots of cables into a, a high-powered PC and providing the most high fidelity VR experience possible they're aiming more for the uh, the wider adoption of, of a potential mobile market is that kind of as far as this extends, or is there anything you read in any of this that says, well, to start with, yes, but they may very quickly advance to something to compete in the Oculus or Vive or even PlayStation VR space? Yeah, well, you know, I, th I think in my mind right now the thing that they're shooting for and maybe the thing that they understand that no one else is quite going for is um, the value of the middle, you know? So everything else that's out there right now or will be out there right now either requires a, you know a specific type of phone or a console or a really high-end computer and so what I'm you know pretty pretty fascinated about is this uh, kind of more recent report that has come out that is talking about I think like you know Tom mentioned earlier a standalone device that you know something that they would put out that um, would be untethered so you don't have bunch of wires, you know, sticking out of the back of your head. You don't have to use any type of a cell phone to power it, and you don't have to plug it into a computer. And, um, I mean, VR has had such a checkered and tricky history as far as kind of moving out beyond uh, the loyalists that, you know, to me it seems like the really solid plan, at least in the early stages, it's just to get it into as many hands as possible and offering, you know, a better version of cardboard, something that, you know, potentially does have sensors and um, kind of follows the mold of this description. And the standalone product could be a way to, you know, get it out to a much larger swath of folks out there, have a little bit better experience in terms of quality, um, and, and then for them also kind of, you know, build out their whole ecosystem and platform around that. So in my mind, it kind of feels like a play to the middle. Well, and I feel like that's, uh, that's one of the things that people complain about is I don't want to have to be tethered. And the other is what you were talking about earlier where, well, okay, cardboard isn't tethered, but then it's limited. And if you can bridge that gap, uh, we had an email from Komei, who's a big fan of VR, trying to point out like, hey, we used to have corded headphones and we used to have big bulky headphones with surround sound and 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 those eventually succeeded people got past their aversion to wearing a big thing on their head and he's like you have parallels he even like made a spreadsheet for us of all the parallels uh to things like google vr or gear vr being that cordless version uh do, do you think do you think we get to a point with vr like we have with music where we have something that's good enough that becomes the more popular thing. And while the Oculus and the, the PlayStation VR may be the higher fidelity virtual experiences, we're fine with the MP3 of virtual reality that we get from maybe Google or Samsung? You know, I think so. I mean, I think that that's a really good point. Um, I grew up in Nashville and I went to kind of a music school and a lot of my friends are audiophiles and they're engineers, you know. And you can listen to them talk all day about headphones and, you know, lossless audio and blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's a great thing to love, and I find it noble. But at the end of the day, it's not a concern for most people, you know. Um, I think that if we get experiences that don't make people sick, 
that you know don't overheat your phone or your device or whatever um, that are sufficiently immersive that they are enjoyable that yeah there's probably a plateau where your average person is just like yeah this is good you know if they're not like um you know, a hardcore gamer or someone who wants something that's a lot, you know, sharper and faster and more immersive for, you know, feeling like you're on a alien planet. Yeah, VR files. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> um, your your comparison to MP3 is a is a really good one, and I was trying to figure out how to, how to formulate this, but yeah, if there's something in the middle that's good enough, and by good enough I mean better than not good, like MP3s for all of their, you know, for all the audio, audio files that look at that stuff and go bad and turn their back to it, it's good. It sounds great. It sounds better than any tapes I used to buy and not that different than the CDs I buy today and some are laughing at me right now as I say that, but for me it's fine and for the biggest part of the population I also think that's fine. So if they can figure out a way to hit that level, um, it's, it's, it's got to be better than garbage though. Like it can't be a 64K MP3, to keep using the analogy, it's got to be at 128 or better, right? Whatever yeah, that means. Don't and, make me sick. Right? <laughs> in that world. But also, you know, the Google Play Store and how they leverage uh, the OS of the device, uh, probably which would it be, you know, some sort of modified Android system, but, but using it in a way that, that best utilizes their stores and their ecosystems and everything. I mean, they could have a serious hit on their hands. And I wonder if this isn't why suddenly... I mean, there's probably other stories we could pull from to get this information, but I wonder if that's why we suddenly stopped hearing about Glass so much and it seemed like immediately started rolling into stories about what they're doing with VR. And to me, the writing's on the wall. I think that... Um, yeah, Glass has become an enterprise product. It's become a tool for, for businesses to use in specific situations. It's, it, they've, they've pretty much stopped developing it as a consumer product. Well, yeah. I'm interested either way. It's going to be great. And do you, it's, it, I would, I would, uh, this is the only other question I would really have about this. From your perspective, Aaron, do you think that that this device is an um, how do I put this? Is this uh, when it comes to enterprise? One of the things people are most excited about with VR is like, oh, the medical uses, and we can create all sorts of surgical models and and other kinds of sort of industry based thinking around using VR. This may be in that good enough category to do some of that, don't you think? I think it could. I mean, you know, one of my favorite recent use cases. Um, for, for cardboard even was, I can't remember where it was, but there was a doctor who used cardboard to make like a, a 3D model of a baby's heart. She had like a heart defect. Um, and so he was able to, to use, you know, that kind of 360 view to analyze sort of like, or put together a strategy for how he was going to repair her heart. And you, you kind of look at that situation and you're like, okay, well, I mean, this is somebody who already had the capability of, you know, uh, putting together like a 3D model like that. And cardboard is cheap and sort of readily available. Um, and he was able to use it in this kind of very real world serious situation. Uh, so, I mean, I think that that's what kind of one of those indicators that there are some actual uses that kind of go beyond sort of like silliness or fun or whatnot. Um, and, and when you hear about those things, it makes people feel more serious about the product, that this is not just like maybe some quirky little bit of swag that they handed out, but this is actually something that maybe your business should look into using if you have, you know, some type of uh, function that could legitimately be bettered by the use of, of 360. Doesn't it feel like it snuck up on them a little bit? Like when they oh, gave totally. these out, they were just like, oh, isn't this funny? We, we made a kind of a cool virtual experience out of a piece of cardboard. Ha, ha, ha. Anyway, and they moved on to other stuff. And now it's like, whoa, a lot of this stuff shipped. And there are products being made based on this spec that are selling on Amazon by the millions. And we were maybe on to something. That's, that's kind of the impression I'm getting. I would love to believe that they had some kind of strategy that they were going to... Um, kind of aim so low brow <laughs> on this that like this is something you can make out of a pizza box that that nobody was was going to kind of get their dander up the way that they did about glass it i mean you can't say that cardboard looks pretentious right yeah definitely not <laughs> <laughs> you can't make like any of those complaints you can't you, you almost don't want to take it seriously cuz it's 
it's cardboard. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so I would, I would love it if that was part of the if thinking. that was true. Uh, well, folks, go check out Aaron's great work at techrepublic.com. We'll have the links in the show notes. Uh, there's, there's a great uh, gallery that you did on patents. If you're looking for more examples of what people might be using VR for, things like firefighter training, uh, building ops where you can see you know, how far before repair certain parts are, what their lifetime usage is in real time, lots of AR stuff, uh, check that out at techrepublic.com. Our pick of the day comes from Sean in fiber-rich Kansas City. Just got to rub it in my face, huh? Uh, it says, just thought I'd pass along a great app I recently found that can best be described as Slack for gamers. It's called Discord at discordapp.com. It's multi-platform, free, has a great user interface, Giphy integration, voice chat, and more. It's missing some things that Slack has, but they've been actively working it on it in the past couple months. Uh, and it's pretty highly rated on, on both the Google Play and iOS app stores. Uh, so you might want to check it out, discordapp.com. Just what you need, Scott, another Slack replacement. Yeah, you know what? I, I mean, I went into Discord actually recently thinking, yeah, I probably ought to get into this. All my gamer friends are using it. It seems like a pretty cool platform, and, and there's some things it does really nice over TeamSpeak and Ventrilo and even Skype that, that we're not getting from those services. And I loaded it up, and I went, oh, my gosh, this is literally like Slack, like the way it's threaded, the way you do information and stuff and posts and plugins and all this stuff outside of all the integrated voice uh, stuff, it is basically kind of a Slack clone. So now I don't know what to do. They're both really good, and I feel kind of torn a little bit because my communities are very, you know, big on both. So yeah, yeah. So I don't know where it's where I stand with it, but Discord's pretty awesome, and uh, they seem to be going crazy with it. I just don't know what their pricing model is, and one day they're going to have to make money, so we'll figure it out. Send your picks to us, folks. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, and you can find more picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. Uh, a lot of great reactions to our discussions yesterday about Twitter and community. Uh, Marlon, the guy from Trinidad, said, I think it's just the fact that it's live. It allows for quick reactions, and as such, just like in real life, misunderstandings could occur if you can't handle it or it gets too much. And he points out Stephen Fry has a public history of depression. Uh, and we got similar uh, comment from Guillaume in Brussels about that. Uh, he said, people also tend to look at interactions as binary. It's either all good or all bad. When I interact with people on social media, I tend to use a continuum and explain that to people. And it ranges from a disapproving look to you're on my list. But I acknowledge that sometimes what the person said isn't all bad. And this is the reason why they should think about what they said. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, and then a really interesting uh, email, and I won't read the whole thing, but it's from Brett Stewart, uh, who talks about, hey, uh, you know, you had mentioned that non-celebrities can still receive negativity when a post goes viral. He was in the Colorado uh, high school, Arapahoe school, that had a school shooting in 2013. He wrote a post in the student newspaper about what it was like to be in that shooting. The piece went viral. It was quoted in the New York Times, Washington Post, the Denver Post. One of the things, one of the minor things he said in that piece was that walking out, it felt like being in a movie like Saving Private Ryan. There was a Yahoo Tech article that only quoted that part of his, uh, of his write-up, and he had a lot of veterans who didn't understand that that was not his main point and didn't see it in context start coming at him on Google Plus and places like that. Uh, and he sent us a link to the actual article as well as the Yahoo Tech article if you want to take a look at it. But uh, he had to suddenly have a bunch of angry veterans saying, you don't know what it's really like when he was like, yeah, I wasn't trying to say I did. I was just trying to say what my impression was having lived through it. Yeah, this, it's, uh, it's an, I read the whole email and it's very interesting uh, stuff. But yeah, this is the problem, right? Like we can't, it's so hard for us to like melt this stuff down into something we can all sort of agree upon. You're going to get harassed for taking something out of context. It's no different in the past than it is today, but it seems like it's just easier today for somebody to say something dumb. I could say something dumb right now and I've done it on the show, like kind of recently, and people will call you on it. And I like being constructively called on stuff. Sure. Because it puts Sometimes me in a place. it's valuable, yeah. It's absolutely valuable. But then there are other times where you're just nitpicking and taking the one little piece and then running with it, and I feel bad for him. That's clearly not what he meant. Well, and, it's, if and it's not, I, I hate to even put the blame at anybody else's feet. Those guys are all making a pretty valid point about what it might really be like to be in the military, but they're all talking about, their, they're all talking about something different to each other. 
So if I could just jump in here for a second on the Yahoo side. I actually know the the distinct process that I was there when this happened and that caused this particular type of problem, which is like, oh, we can't put this whole thing up. Let's just create the most interesting clip and put it up. And the only thing I would say to this kid who obviously has, A, been through so much, uh, let's take a moment to realize that, is that that author doesn't work at Yahoo anymore. Oh. Well, that's interesting. That's I can't an interesting say bit it's of related inside to baseball. this. Yeah, it's not to related to this, but he right. doesn't work there anymore. And it's, you know, like that sort of that sort of quick turnaround stuff has its own pitfalls, and this is a really good example of that, that and that is repeated again and again in the larger internet world. Sometimes it is the fault of the author, uh, and, and yet I still say it's the responsibility of the reader to evaluate your source and yeah. to say, well, wait a minute, are they? Am I getting the whole story here? Uh, yes. Because there's there's lots of examples of things like that, and I have been uh, guilty of half reading a headline and forming an opinion, and even expressing an opinion about that before I've actually read the full story, and then going back and saying, oh, wait a minute, that's not what the if, story is actually. If I had a fifty dollar bill for every time I came to Tom with a headline. <laughs> I do this all the time and I, and I always do it before and offline and before we do a show but I'm like dude look at this and he'll go alright now you know what I'm going to say right and then I'll stop and think and go oh, shoot you're right like this is complete garbage or this is conjecture or this is whatever it does take some work to see that stuff to learn to look past it to look under it to find the sources but yeah I think Tom's absolutely right it is on us also so it's on those veterans it's on a lot of people to to, to Consider the sources, form opinions based on a, a more thorough understanding of what's going on, and then approaching somebody and having a conversation with them. Yeah, your, your opinion carries more weight than ever before, which is great, but it leads to a little more responsibility. I mean, Aaron, I'm sure you've run into this where someone has misinterpreted something you've written before. Well, you know, I mean, the thing that kind of comes to mind is, um, so I was the editor of my college paper, and so I, I, I keep an eye on it still, as I think all former editors do. Um, <laughs> and I remember that baby. there was this this uh, this little flap that happened, you know, maybe like a year or two ago, where the the sports editor had written an editorial that I thought she was completely in her right to do, and she just got just got attacked. It was nuts, um, and to the point where she was like begging the advisor to just take the article down, you know, and and so that was an interesting conversation um, to kind of witness a little bit about you know, uh, this idea that it means something very different in this day and age to produce content and consume it and then kind of realizing, well, like, at what point in your life is sort of um, a developing person or even further on down the line, do you, do you fully, like, learn and, or get those skills, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, when are you being taught that when you see something that's on the internet that you really need to check out. Is that a blog post? Is that somebody's opinion? Aaron, Was I'll answer opinion? you. It's not in the <laughs> Yahoo comment section. That's <laughs> right? for sure. Yeah. Yahoo commenters are the absolute worst, and I know that from sure. personal experience. So it's also, again, all about the community. Yep. Yeah, no, for sure. And and it's kind of a, you know, a sad thing to, I mean, I, I'm sure that you know for this kid there was some amount of catharsis in writing about this experience. Um, but but the sad truth is you have to be prepared that you know something that you wrote that even if you felt that it was innocuous could just end up being the subject of of a lot of vitriol. Yeah, so. as Shane said in our chat room just now, look before you tweet. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, finally, Russell wrote in and pointed out that he thought it was fun when we were talking about the quartz storage, that long-term storage that can hold terabytes, hundreds of terabytes of information. Uh, that it said it had, could hold it for a lifetime of approximately 13.8 billion years, since that's the estimated current age of the universe. Wow, that's so, true. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. That uh, that that storage lasts at least one universe length <laughs> up till now. Okay. Yeah. That's where you go after the edibytes. You get to the universe side. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, thanks again to Darren Kitchen for joining us. Hack5.org, H-A-K-5.org. Uh, thank you, Scott Johnson, for joining us. Frogpants.com. What else is going on? Well, we just launched a new little weekly project, myself and Justin Robert Young, another frequenter of the DTNS uh, staff. And uh, he and I are doing something called Hotline Monday, 
every Monday at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. We do a live call-in show uh, for about an hour, and uh, you can find all the details at frogpants.com slash hotline Monday, or you will be able to find that URL later today. But very excited about it. We did a beta show on Monday and had a blast, so go check it out. Aaron, thank you so much. It's great to have you back. TechRepublic.com, of course, to find uh, a lot of Aaron's writing. Where else can people find you? Um, I'm on Twitter. At Aaron Carson is probably the, the best place to hit me up. E-R-I-N-C-A-R-S-O-N. Uh, thanks to everybody who supports the show. Patreon.com slash DTNS. We are uh, <clears throat> more than 50% towards being able to have day six as a regular addition to the show. Uh, so if you get value out of the show, all we're asking is, hey, give a little bit of that value back. Uh, tell us what the show is worth. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash support. Our email address is feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. You can give us a call, 512-59-DAILY. That's 512-593-2459. Catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern at AlphaGeekRadio.com and DiamondClub.tv. Visit our website, DailyTechNewsShow.com. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young and maybe Veronica Belmont if she's better. Talk to you then. The show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Good show, you guys. What should we call it? It was great. Um, let's see. <laughs> FBI huffs and puffs on Apple's back door. <laughs> Uh, tweeting Lyrical. in GIFs. I know. Uh, Alphabet's jigsaw puzzle. No Apple for the FBI. Hmm. <laughs> uh, Apple of my FBI. Don't use it, but it's kind of stupid. Dad joke. I love it. <laughs> does it? This doesn't yeah. fit. You're right. It, you know, yeah. You can, you can spell an eye out, but yeah. Tuck it away. Tuck right. it away. Uh, the MP3 of virtual reality. Um, an apple a day keeps the FBI away. Obvi. Hmm. Uh, Obvi. Uh, <coughs> VR, VR files. How do you spell that? V R O files, I guess. P H I L. That chance to, to make up that Let's word. Coin it. <laughs> coin it. Yeah, uh, we'll we'll be top of the search results for VR files. <laughs> yeah, Jurassic Park. <laughs> nice. I like that. Uh, 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 oh, Fandango buys Rotten Tomatoes and Flickster. What? Yeah. Wow. The Verge just had it. Uh, so Michael Fandango bought Flickster. Yeah. Because Flickster, and, I think, already owned Rotten yeah, Tomatoes. Yeah, owns Rotten Tomatoes. But Rotten Tomatoes, like, really is the name that people care about. I feel and like. And then Flickster has its own video service, which no one knows yeah. about. But yeah. the, it's, uh, it's ultraviolet supported. Which is interesting because Fandango has been putting out a lot of original content lately. I, what was it that if I went and saw this weekend, I would have gotten a free version of the first movie in the series? Like, yeah. they, they were giving away a free copy of the previous movie but i don't remember what movie it was yeah i uh i uh i'm like that's smart Give, giving away yeah. movies to go see movies well done yep. i have a friend who works for their original content creation and so i sense um i sense a larger plan um god i can't believe yahoo oh, i should not go down this road but okay should we go oh. mp3 of virtual yeah. reality or vr files VR files. Yeah, that's fine. All right. I mean, you know. <laughs> um, also, I you feel know, like, kids. yeah, we haven't had a chance to do this for a while, and so I thought you should know that in my neighborhood, the things that are going on are free boxes. Free boxes? How to describe a suspect to the police, always useful in Hollywood. Hmm. Uh, dog beach. And Ooh, thieves just stole my. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna click on that. And thieves just stole my <laughs> catalytic converter. Followed by trusted cleaning lady. <laughs> oh, really? The juxtaposition is amazing. Yes. Coincidence? Yes. Coincidence. Totally coincidence. <clears throat> That's hilarious. 
Catalytic cleaning lady. It's a it's a petition for a do- three five beaches for off leash dogs. Each would be a quarter mile wide. Ah, That's not okay. bad. So like what they'll they do in Huntington do Beach, but up here. Yeah. Nice. Because there's only like one little tiny strip in Malibu that I know of. Yeah, Leo Carrillo, right? Some it's some well, some of those require leashes, but there there's like this little strip of like basically no man's land that's often underwater. Uh-huh. Uh, um, that uh, that yeah. Yeah, Redondo and Huntington both have official like maintained dog beaches, which are yeah. awesome. Anyway, that was usually we do that in the pre-show, but mine came in late. Aaron, this is what we do for fun. <laughs> we read nextdoor.com posts. Oh, man. Great job, by the way. That was super awesome. Yeah, well Thank done. You. you brought the authority. <laughs> oh, Lord. I, <laughs> yeah, it, it just always cracked me up how, like, last year, and I can't remember if I told you guys this story or not, but I had been talking with Jason, and we're like, oh, yeah, I wish you guys would do, like, a post a month on VR or something like that, you know? <laughs> yeah, and all of a sudden, it's yeah. an industry. I have an idea, Tom. When you first do the inevitable, and you know this is going to happen, but the inevitable VR episode of DTNS where everyone involved is wearing a helmet, we're all in some virtual room that somebody put out that works, uh, and you're just recording it, but you're doing it to test or whatever. You've got to have Aaron back on for that. Totally. Oh, yeah. You and I will both have Oculus Rifts by then. <laughs> we should all do this. That'd be really fun. That'd be so fun. That's it, like it, an it, actual it, roadmap it, plan. Yeah, it could be the worst thing ever, but it might be great. So, <laughs> I'm going I like it yeah. You, would you come? Would you come back for that, Aaron? Oh, hundred percent. Awesome. Hi. <laughs> so you guys have ordered uh, the Rift. Yep. Yep. Mm. When's your ship date? Jul- June. June. Mine's May. Really, yours is after me. I think mine's May. I think mine's before you. How, how can that be? Do you not know your birthday? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, Tom ordered before me, and I thought he was getting his before. Maybe mine is. Oh, April, then. <laughs> I thought we were talking about birthdays. I was like, "Come on, Scott." In April. Tom, <laughs> I think you're getting yours in April because I think it was a month before me. Yeah, I'm, you're right. I'm getting mine in April. I don't know why I thought it was June. Yeah. It's not on release day though. It's later. Yeah. Well, it's amazing how quickly like they were blowing through the stock. I mean. Not- I never got my email yesterday to buy the bundle though. Oh. I didn't either. I something about that yesterday it an they started going out yesterday supposedly and you could you could start buying bundles on pre-order at like best buy i think uh-huh. there was another thing that was um amazon too or amazon okay it was doing something yeah crazy can you upgrade to the bundle well, yeah, what they're doing is if you if you checked that box when you yeah. bought your Rift, they're going to send you a special offer to upgrade your order to include the bundle, <clears throat> and you can choose from the Ace or the Dell or the Alienware. Oh, okay, yeah. All right. Yeah, I haven't gotten that either. I did select that, though. Yeah, I selected um, it, too. I Those are also shipping late. <laughs> really want to get an Oculus quite badly. You should get one. I know. You need the computer to only, run it on too. That's, that's the, the that's the sticking point right there. I am your sticking point example <laughs> of not wanting a big giant Alienware VR PC. Where like where would it be? Although I guess here would be pretty good. He's problem yeah. solved. Put it under a desk. Put it under a desk, and then it it um I have room to move around a little bit in this office. Is Doghouse yeah. doing any like? Oculus ready type. Uh, it's funny you should ask. I have a meeting with them tomorrow, and I'm going to ask them that very question because I think they nice. should if they aren't. Don't you think? It seems like you know, small ma- manufacturer like that that's trying to you know do something maybe a little bit different than the big boys. I think it'd be awesome. Yeah, I think so too. I'm going to ask them about that. Aaron, we just like hang around and edit and stuff. So you're welcome to hang around and edit, but if you have like a job. <laughs> that you have to do. Oh, I am at the end of my day. Oh, good. Oh, good. Hang out. Yeah. <laughs> We're almost done. Yeah. Yeah. I just didn't want you to think this was like part of the job. Like oh, this no. is the optional part of the job. I like that, <laughs> I like that you spelled it like I used to for my kids when I didn't want them to know what I was talking about. I like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't like, know why I did that. Don't want like, the boss to hear. 
Yeah, yeah. I need to go to J-O-B. bed before S A N T A. J O P. No, no. I'm I'm done for the day. I, uh, All right. I've been fighting off like a cold or an allergy or something, so I think I'm just gonna go home and like crash and take yeah. like, a half day tomorrow or something. I was worried I was gonna like spend the show like hacking or like blowing my nose. <laughs> Man, I'm getting it would over not something. So be yeah, the I'm first right time. That's something. Aaron, Everyone was sick. It's a deal. With not that. the first time. Yeah. <laughs> Did Veronica um, end up with your thing, Tom? Does she have like full on flu? It sounds like it's pretty close to the same thing. Yeah. So what you're saying is that flu came from Hawaii. Maybe. Yeah. Although she didn't get it till February, so I don't know. Uh, maybe it was a lurker. And Eileen, knock on wood, never got it. Mm. Did you get a shot? No. She's tougher. Yeah. She's just She's tougher. tougher. Yeah. <laughs> Producers are tougher, and we're exposed to more people. Uh, so that, like, it, you, you might get, like, a little whiff of it, but then you defeat it. Uh, but Tom lives in his basement, and Veronica lives in a small room, and so they don't have, like, good... <laughs> yeah. good immunity so many support. stereotypes so just many. stereotyping just so right many. and left <laughs> so I, I, I think about that all the time because I travel about once a month for work and so yeah. you know it's just like airport to airport to airport um, and, and so far I've yet to come back sick from one of those trips that's amazing so yeah and oh, I just got back from Houston on Monday, which wasn't a work trip, but of course that that's the trip that like I got back from the airport late, went to bed, three hours later woke up and was like, oh my throat's on fire. <laughs> but otherwise, I've had pretty good luck. So. They say if you sit on the aisle, you have a greater chance of catching something because oh. that's where everybody touches the armrests and stuff. And, Interesting. See, I'm a window yeah. seat person. And my and I, yeah. my wife is too. I'm a window seat. I just want to lear- turn my head and stare at the mm-hmm. world. Exactly. <laughs> and continually marvel at being 30,000 feet in the air traveling very I, fast. Before knowing that, I would always choose the aisle because I would have the ability to stick my feet out, you know, yeah. and get a little extra room. But now I'm, I don't think it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. I just end up, like, getting the window seat and just passing out. That's yeah. my whole motivation is just the side of the airplane. That's the kind of person I want to sit next to is the person who doesn't have to get <laughs> yep. up either. Who just leans towards out. the window. Yeah. 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 Totally. I think my friends made it to Buenos Aires by now, which is super exciting. They had multiple <clears throat> legs. Oh, on their way to Antarctica? On their way to Antarctica. I'm so exciting. Wow. Yeah. That's exciting. I'm like tracking their progress because it's really, uh, it's really quite something. Yeah. Well, that's like a bunch of vacation photos I'd want to see. Uh, right? I mean, mostly polar... No, not polar bears. That's Penguins. elsewhere. Penguins. Penguins. Yeah. Wait, are there polar bears in the South Pole? I thought that was like the North Pole. I can't yeah, remember I think polar bears pole. are in the North. Like, polar bears are definitely... Well, actually, now, weirdly enough, they're like in Canada. They're in Canada. Like, suit that they're in super, Kansas at this point. Just, yeah, I think there's probably more of them in Kansas than there are, unfortunately, in the North Pole. There's one um, lost. They won't move there for the Polar bears only live in the Northern Hemisphere. Thanks, hey. Roger. Thanks, hey, Roger. Hey, yep. <clears throat> Thanks, Rogerpedia. Well, hold on, hold on. I really don't exist in the wild. How did how did a polar bear kill Greg Gung- Grungberg as he was trying to get, figure out what happened to the plane? How'd exactly. That how hey, did the he? Writers made it happen. Oh, all right. Where did that polar bear come? <laughs> polar from? bears also live in the mind of the writers of Lost. Okay. And how did how did they get lost on the islands of Hawaii for so many seasons? <laughs> I mean, everybody goes to that particular valley in Hawaii. I don't know why they didn't run into anybody. It's ridiculous. That uh, would have been the best way to end the show. If yeah. Zoomed out, and there's like a city nearby. Like. Found, but it was too short, so they just dropped the found part. And just said, lost. Uh, look at that cute little baby foot. Oh. It's baby foot day. Well, I thought All right, but... I'm out of the post. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.